This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, and welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Laura Lotka. Today in studio, we have Billy Thomas and Chad Nyman. Billy is an extension forester, and Chad is a primary forest product specialist. Both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. And it's a pleasure to have you both in studio today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, thank you for having us. So we're going to talk about the economic impact report today, but before we get started talking about that, uh, let us know what you both do for UK. Sure. So this is Billy. Um, I am an extension forester. So that means I basically extend our forestry knowledge that we develop here at the university and in other places across Kentucky, trying to help woodland owners specifically as my main audience, trying to help them care for and manage their woods to be as healthy and productive as possible. Do that in a wide variety of ways through educational programs, workshops, publications, just however we can reach people and try to educate them about taking care of their woods. And Chad? And this is Chad, and so I work uh, with forest products directly with the Kentucky Master Logger Program, loggers out across our state, and folks working inside the sawmills uh, across our state as well. And so I use a lot of the same mechanisms that Billy does in different workshops, uh, a lot of those you know, inside of these uh, facilities around the state. So we work directly with uh, these loggers and sawmill folks, trying to meet the needs that they have and trying to address problems that they have throughout Kentucky. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the economic contribution report for Kentucky's forest sector, and um, we will have this uh, report posted on our website, on our episodes page, so we'll kind of refer to it, but if you need Mm -hmm. a copy of it, it will be up there for you. But before we get started, just kind of give us an overview, um, you know, how's the forest industry looking, how's the forestry sector looking for this year? Sure, it's a big industry, Mm -hmm. it really is, and we've been doing this annual contribution reporting since 2012. And we've really been doing it to try to highlight and raise the everybody's awareness of how important and how large the forest sector is here in Kentucky. If you just look at the overall numbers, things are relatively flat or you know more or less stable over the last few years. But really, there's a lot of nuance to that. You know, when you're dealing with such a big sector, there'll be some that are up, other mm-hmm. parts that are down, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But overall, at the big picture level, we're pretty flat, stable, if you would, over the last few years. But again, there. There are some nuances to okay. that. No, thank you. And also, just kind of to clarify, um, we talk, and probably we will be talking about the primary and secondary industry. Can you tell us um, what those two industries are? And So the primary yeah. side is that first level of processing where you take the log and you're turning it into boards or veneer or chips. The secondary side, you're taking those boards or veneer and you're turning them into a finished product like hardwood flooring or a desk. Uh, different products like that. So how much does this contribute? You said it was a big thing. It is big, Renee. So how big? It really is. And and just for your listeners to kind of set the stage a little bit, mm-hmm. when we're talking about economic contributions, we'll throw out a few different numbers, and I kind of want to give some context to those. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about direct numbers, and direct numbers refers to things that are directly tied to an industry. So this would be the actual, like, the sales of a company, if you could imagine. Okay. That would be an example of something direct, or the number of employees that work in that company. That's a direct uh, thing. But we also talk about indirect and induced. And indirect would be companies or other things that kind of support that first industry. Um, So they're, you know, part of the hotels or or gas stations or whatever. They're supplying the forest sector with resources and goods and services. So that's some indirect impact. And then induced is basically the spending the money, the income that these secondary people get from tied to the forest sector. So it kind of trickles down a little bit Mm -hmm. and it gets smaller and smaller. But there are a variety of kind of ways that we look at this. And if you just look at overall the direct impact of our forest sector here in Kentucky. We estimated in 2018 that it was just over $8.5 billion. Wow, that's big. That's huge. Mm-hmm. That's directly 
to the forest sector here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the number of employees in that. We have over 26,000 employees that are directly employed in the Kentucky forest sector. Now, if you expand that out and you look at that total number, where we include that indirect and induced um, effects, Mm -hmm. then that number swells to over 13 billion. We actually estimated at 13.51 billion for 2018. And then likewise, the number of employees jumps a lot too. Over 60,000 employees are tied to the forest sector in one way or another. So that when I say that the forest sector is big in Kentucky, that's what we mean. Mm-hmm. It is it's really big. big. And can you tell us where, the, or tell our listeners where it's located? And Sure. So the forest sector is really diffuse. It's mm-hmm. spread out across Kentucky. And that's one thing that makes it hard, I think, for a lot of folks to realize just how big it is. You know, you might see a mill here or a cabinet shop there, or you might see somebody harvesting trees here or there. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the whole thing, it's all across the state. It really is. And it's all those little jobs and little operations. And many of our companies that work in the forest sector really are family-owned businesses. Many of them are small. Almost all of our loggers, I would say, Chad, are really very small businesses. And that probably extends to a number of our sawmills as well. Absolutely. And it makes sense that we would have this as almost nearly 50% of the state is covered in forest. And so we have that in all 120 counties. We have industries in 113 of our counties. So it's very diffuse, if you Mm -hmm. will. You know, and, and one thing that... I think it's important that listeners understand is it's not a rural issue, right? Mm-hmm. This is, we have some of our most active industry is in Jefferson County, yeah. in, in Kentucky, if you think about that. You know, really our most populous city um, and most populous county has really the most activity from a forest sector in a lot of ways as far as jobs mm-hmm. and spinoff industries and stuff like that. So that's pretty neat um, just to say that it's not just rural. It's really statewide. And I think if people haven't already caught on to this, because we keep saying Kentucky, we are just talking about the state of Kentucky. We are not talking about the nation. That's a good point, Renee. And, you know, when, when we in Kentucky, we're really kind of a hardwood. So we're mm-hmm. talking about trees that basically lose their leaves in the fall. That's most of our trees are like that. Now in southern United States, southeastern, we go a lot more pine trees and they're pretty big down there as well. But if you're just looking at hardwoods, we're one of the leading producers of hardwood lumber in the U.S., in the entire U.S. I think we're in the top two or three. You know, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and us, we all kind of fight back and forth, and Tennessee jumps up every now and then. But we're in those top as far as the number of producers uh, or, or hardwood production uh, is Kentucky. We're a leader in that. And, Chad, what are some of those trees that are considered hardwoods? So you've got your oaks, your maples, your hickories. You've got gums, tupelo, sycamore. There's a broad there's a variety. variety of these broadleaf trees. Okay. So there's a lot out there that people would consider hardwoods. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the estimates, the Nature, um, Kentucky State Nature Preserves Commission estimates about 112, 115 different native trees here in Kentucky. And most of those are hardwoods. So, you know, we have a lot of species out there. And about 50 of them have commercial value where we can kind of harvest them and sell them. So... There's a lot of diversity out there in our forest, for sure. Without digging too much into the weeds, um, (laughs) um, why why does Kentucky have so many hardwoods compared to other states? It really has to do with our climate and where we're geographically located. We're kind of in the middle of the country, Mm -hmm. so we have species that kind of grow in the north, and we also have species that grow in the south, Mm -hmm. and species that grow a little in the east and a little in the west. So we're kind of in that sweet spot from a geographic standpoint. The other thing that adds to us is we have a very different kind of physiographic, if you look at our state, you know, Mm -hmm. we have bottomlands, we have highlands, um, we have plain areas, so we have a lot of diversity in habitat, a lot of diversity in soil. Oils. So that creates a lot of opportunities for um, trees to find a home. Mm -hmm. It really does. So that's part of why we have so much diversity here in Kentucky. Great growing conditions too, really. Mm -hmm. Good. So for this report, how did you, how do you find the data? How do you collect this information on the the economic contributions. That's a lot of dollars to try to figure (laughs) out where you get this from. It is, and we spend a lot of time working on this. And, you know, Chad, I think one of the most important things that we have here in Kentucky when it comes to reporting on our economic contribution of our forest sector is really is our directory. We have a great directory here in Kentucky of our forest industries, and that really helps us out a lot. Absolutely. And so that's a mutual project between the Kentucky Division of Forestry and the University of Kentucky to maintain that database of all these active industries we have. And so we try to keep that up regularly and keep in contact with these industries and, you know, having relevant information in there. And we actually have that in a print copy that came out in 2014. Mm -hmm. 
And so that keeps that information archived, but we have this available online on a University of Kentucky website. And so folks can go on there and be able to search for industries within their county or by a specific company name. And so they're able to really see how much industry is in their area. And some of these companies even sell to the general public. So is that the primary and secondary that you can find in this? Yes, and okay. you can search by primary or by secondary, and you can search by specific uh, products if you were wanting to source like railroad ties or cedar lumber or specific mm -hmm. things like that. You could look for those within that database online. So if you're looking for a specific product, you can find it yes. online. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's really a wealth of information. And, you know, and I'll be honest, Chad, I, I share that with woodland owners and others often that are looking for, you know, who's buying this in my area. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way for people to find that out. So, so that directory really serves as a kind of a foundation of how we're able to make these estimates. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of the other sources that we have to rely on as well. One of the primary sources we use is called Implan, and that is a software system, and it's also a data system that we basically purchase on an annual basis to get the data for Kentucky by county of the production levels of basically all industries, if you will. And they gather that data from a lot of government sources, but the thing they do with that is they package it in a way that it makes it really easy to kind of drill down to this exact industry that you're of interest and get the the kind of contributions that that industry is contributing to an area. So we use that as a primary source and then we use the directory to check that to make sure that the numbers are reflective of what we know to be happening in Kentucky and we can use that actually to make adjustments because one of the challenges with a lot of this econ contribution reporting stuff is there's a data lag. You know, so we just released this latest report for 2017 and 2018 and everybody's saying, well, hey, Billy, it's 2019. Well, I was just getting ready to ask yeah. you, why does this why, report why, say why that? do you not have 2019 data? And we well, don't 2019 have 2019 not over. <laughs> yes, because we are just starting in yeah. 2019 in many ways. So there's usually a, at least a year data lag mm -hmm. that before we can have the actual results from what happened. So it takes a little while for that data to get processed and get used. And then it takes us a little while to actually develop the reports from that data. So we're usually always at least a year behind. And honestly, our 2018 estimates are, are basically estimates of our 2017 hard numbers that we have that we know are good and we feel good about. Um, but the 2018 data is not even available yet. So we take that 2017 data and then we use that directory to make adjustments for our estimates on what's going on in 18. So we survey the industry and we get a feel for how things went in 2018. And then we use that survey information from the different industries out there to make adjustments for 2018. And so how long does it take you all to put this data and this report together? <laughs> you know, overall, if you if we've gotten faster at it, I'm going to tell you <laughs> that. Um, but overall, you know, we usually are able to get the data in January or so, and then it takes us a couple months. We uh, supplement it with a lot of export data. We also, one of the big components that Chad adds to this report is our um, commodity pricing. So we get um, prices for delivered products, whether that's, um, you know, boards or it's actual um, staves or, you know, you know, uh, railroad ties or whatever these different products are. Mm -hmm. um, Chad works with the Division of Forestry to get some of that information. So that's a um, big part of it as well. But it takes a couple months, really, um, once you go through everything to kind of have it ready for public consumption. Tell us, we're kind of looking at the, and you all can, you know, if you're looking at home, you can click on the report on our website, but we're kind of looking at this as well. And it, there's a lot of uh, master loggers and distributions of different industries. There's a map here and we're kind of looking at it. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about um, master loggers and how they contribute to this and what, uh, what it's even about here. So by Kentucky law, every logging, every commercial logging job has to have at least one Kentucky master logger on site. Mm -hmm. And so to get that Kentucky master logger designation, uh, they have to attend a three day training session to get that designation. And so they have to keep up their continuing education hours, which is six hours every three years. And uh, so that they have to have that on each logging job. Now looking here, we've got over almost 2,500 master loggers spread out in, throughout the entire state. We have master loggers in every single county, all 120 counties. And uh, if you can see, you know, if you're looking at this map here, you can see the blue dots on there are the industries, and they're scattered out across there. And the darker the green, the more loggers in that county. Mm -hmm. 
So it looks like there's a wide variety in almost every county. Maybe not all counties have a blue dot, but almost every county has some kind of wood industry facility. Is that what I'm looking at here? Absolutely. Okay. How many wood industries are there in Kentucky? We estimate 731, and that really comes from our directory information largely. Um, So we feel pretty good about that estimate. You know, one of the challenges is sometimes you may have very small businesses that that maybe not last very long, Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to keep up with the very smallest of businesses, but we really feel pretty good about those, those numbers right now. And what kind of businesses would that incorporate? So you've got everything from a traditional sawmill that's making boards and cans and railroad ties to folks that are making veneer. You've got folks that are making crown molding and millwork. We've got barrels and staves for the bourbon industry. We've got... That's a big industry, too. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) And so we've got a very diverse wood industry is one of the really neat things about it. We've got uh, folks down around Corbin that are making ice cream sticks out of Uh, beach and Mm -hmm. you've got just a wide variety of products that are coming out of Kentucky using different species of wood. That would be something to see, seeing this big tree down to a popsicle. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, wood is good. It can be used for a wide variety (laughs) of things. And we really use wood a lot, you know, and if you look at our report here that we've put together, we actually break the Kentucky forest sector into kind of six subsectors, if you will. And we start with logging because that's, you know, without the harvesting of trees, you don't have that raw material. It It really is. And and one of the challenges with logging a little bit is, is that it may be relatively small in size compared to these others. But without it, you don't really have the others. So logging is absolutely critical. Our landowners have really no means of getting their product to market without loggers. And our sawmills and our our secondary producers of wood products, they wouldn't have any wood if it wasn't for loggers. So loggers are critical, and they do a lot of hard work. They really do. So we're really appreciative of our logging force out here in Kentucky. And those that have gone through the Master Logger Program have really shown that they want to be doing things the right way as well. But if you look Look at some of the other sectors we have. We also, the next kind of smallest sector we have overall is what we call wood residue. And that would be like bark, mulch, if you would. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of mulch manufacturers here in the state. And also our charcoal manufacturers. You know, we have two Kingsford facilities here and other charcoal facilities here in Kentucky. So when we think about wood residue, that's kind of what we're talking about there, kind of those byproducts, if you will, a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think that just goes to show, Chad, really, we have very little waste when in the forest industry here in Kentucky. We really don't let any of that wood go to waste. We try to find some use for it um, Mm -hmm. without a doubt. And even some of the wood that we can't find a product ends up getting converted as well. Yes. It gets turned into energy that can help, you know, support the facilities there, could help support dry kilns or other operations. Are there a lot of facilities that use? There are quite a few facilities in the state that will use the sawdust that is residue from their lumber production to actually dry their lumber. They'll use it in the boilers to heat the kilns that are drying the lumber. And so it is all being used there on site. They don't have to haul it other places. Mm -hmm. They're able to utilize it right there on site to dry their lumber and add value to that lumber. And then by drying that lumber, it stays in a consistent shape and they don't have to worry about it cupping and twisting. It's more valuable, Mm -hmm. can be used into a lot of different products that way. So they're technically using the whole tree at that point. They really are. And Mm -hmm. I mean, we we don't want to waste anything. We really don't. I think the forest sector does a good job of utilization for sure. You know, and so if you go on beyond the wood residue, kind of the next um, smallest, if you will, uh, amongst our six subsectors would be the pulp and paper sector. And that's really, we have a couple facilities um, basically paper companies here in Kentucky that are um, producing um, a variety of different paper products. So that's what, that's the next one. And then jumping on up uh, as far as kind of direct contributions that these different subsectors make would be primary wood. And that would be some of the sawmills that Chad was talking about where mm-hmm. basically we take that log and we convert it into lumber, which then goes into our next sector. I want to talk about the secondary sector. Mm-hmm. And that's where we end up with those finished products, the doors or cabinets or the molding or other things that are going to kind of be installed by consumers or some other in the construction industry. And then the final one that uh, sometimes maybe gets overlooked is paper converters. We use paper in a wide variety of ways, and these are facilities that may make Post-it notes like 3M. We have a 3M facility here that makes Post-it notes in Kentucky, Mm -hmm. but it also could be making envelopes. It could be making wrappers for fast food, just a wide variety of paper products that are out there. So when you look at all of the different subsectors, those are the six subsectors 
filters that we use. So you've got logging, wood residue, the pulp or paper, if you would, then primary wood, secondary wood manufacturing, and then paper converters. So those six subsectors make up the Kentucky forest sector. And even within each one of those, there's a number of smaller, you know, you can even get a little finer tune uh, with mm -hmm. that. So it's pretty neat to have that diversity of use of wood products here in Kentucky. It really is. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. I'm an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at University of Kentucky. I'm here to teach you a little bit about the animals that live in our forests, especially those here in Kentucky. For those of you who might just be joining us, each week we'll play a wildlife sound from our forest. Here's our sound for this week. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we'll talk about this animal and why it is making that sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. Another thing that we include in this economic contribution report is timber output and prices. So if you're interested to understand what the value of different quality um, of tree species are, um, we have in this report a basically a table that shows you the delivered log prices for many of our most common species that we use. And and Chad's been working on that and he's got some other information in there that I think it's really interesting for folks to be able to see what these individual products cost um, before they end up getting made into other things down the road. Mm -hmm. And so looking at 2018, Billy, we're estimating that somewhere around 731 million board feet of hardwood logs were harvested in Kentucky. And so that is a small decline from 2017 harvest levels, but we had you know record rainfall and things that impact Certainly that logging not. on the ground. Um, when you look at the prices, we saw some decreases, uh, quite a few decreases in price from the beginning of 2018 to the end. And, and as we get into 2019, we've continued to see some of those decreases that aren't captured in this table here. But just going through some of these main species, uh, primary species that we've got, we've got ash. And so looking at ash, we've got the pricing for that decreasing about four and a four and a half percent from the beginning of 2018. And a lot of the reasoning for that has been the decreased export demand. And uh, we're just really having a tough time finding good ash with ambrosia beetle getting into those uh, yeah. dead and ash trees that were killed by emerald Certainly, ash Certainly, yeah. And some of your listeners may have heard some they of the really stories. Yeah, the emerald ash borer has just devastated our ash trees here in Kentucky. And, um, you know, and Chad had mentioned the ambrosia beetle. This was a secondary invader. So not only does the... One, but two. I know, exactly. It's like a double whammy, really, for off, our ash yeah. trees. But yes. the, the problem with that ambrosia beetle is it's really degrading the wood very fast, much faster than we really thought it could and it's resulting in really not being uh, not there the wood not having enough integrity to be able to be converted into a product unfortunately mm. so it's kind of getting a little soft and mushy and won't hold up right can you use it for firewood at that point or is oh, you you can. that's even, a good point you might though. not want to you know that one thing we always talk about um, when we come to forest health is don't move firewood right. so i will tell everybody please do not move firewood mm -hmm. right. um, and we don't move firewood because often there's insects or other things that are in that wood and you could be introducing it into a new area so in you may county be, that it didn't exist right before. so you may be moving your problem to somebody else so you know we really encourage folks to not move firewood mm -hmm. and, and, and purchase it um, where you're at and burn it where you're at right. and, and don't be transporting it sorry yes. a little aside there no it's yeah. all good yes if they're able to use it right there locally and not be transporting it somewhere that would be a good thing to do yeah. but you really want to avoid that transportation and spreading it around uh, looking at some of the other species uh, cherry is something that we don't have a ton of in this state, uh, but the prices on it can fluctuate uh, greatly. 
Uh, the quality that we have here for cherry is, is, you know, decent. It isn't some of that higher elevation cherry you get up in Pennsylvania and New York. Um, but we do have decent markets for that. We've seen a decrease of about 18% hmm. uh, for our higher quality cherry logs, and that has continued to slide backwards. And uh, that was one that the export pricing was really uh, stiffening that pricing, making it a better price for landowners in Kentucky and loggers that were harvesting that. Um, another species that uh, we we have decent volumes of in this state is chestnut oak, and we've been seeing some growing demand and uh, pricing headed upwards uh, since about the end of 2016. Uh, for the really high-end stuff, we've seen it uh, decrease about 7% for those high-quality logs, but the medium and low-quality logs have been increasing quite a bit. I think we have about 8.5% increase on the medium quality logs and, and about a 34% increase on those low quality chestnut oak logs. That's a big jump. It is. Chad, what's been driving kind of that increased interest or demand for chestnut oak? Do you, do you have a sense for that here in the state? There's a couple of different markets that that seems to be going into. Uh, the Japanese markets really like chestnut oak. It has a, you know, so it's a white oak. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit darker brown uh, white oak color to it mm -hmm. and so it's used a lot in flooring and just a lot of appearance great you know furniture and things okay. like that and so, so it's basically the look is what's driving it's very much and we're seeing a really uh, large demand for white oak generally and uh, some of these folks might have heard of the white oak initiative that's uh, been growing and, and just trying to raise the awareness of yeah, the bottleneck that we're having in the regeneration of white oak compared to the very mature overstory that we have of white oak. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of big white oak trees, but we don't have the small trees coming back to replace them. We're getting more shade tolerant species like maple. There is a lot of demand, I would say, Chad, Huge for white oak, yes. for sure. And, uh, and and like you said, you're kind of seeing that maybe trickle down and hitting some other species as, as well, causing some movement in those other Bourbon species. Bourbon being are, a high demand. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. And, you know, just as a reminder for your listeners, you know, you cannot have bourbon technically or With legally or regulation-wise without it being um, stored for two years in freshly charred white oak barrels. And it has to be white oak. Right? It has to be by regulation. Now, there are a couple of other species, I think, that could substitute for our pure Quercus alba or white oak that we think of, but there's not many. Right. And really, white oak is the, the main main species by far. Is yeah. there a reason for that? There yeah. is. Uh, the heartwood is exclusively what they use. So there's okay, sapwood. Explain heartwood. <laughs> yeah. Sapwood, which is the outside of the log, essentially, right below the bark. Mm -hmm. And then as you go in past that lighter colored living sapwood, you get into the heartwood, which is no longer living, that center of the tree. And trees can vary in how much heartwood and sapwood that they have. But that heartwood of the white oak has what's called tyloses in there, and they block those uh, vessels. And so it ends up keeping the water held in there, or the bourbon, if you would. And so they quarter saw that, so it ends up going on the radial face of the wood. And so you end up having all those tyloses packed in there and it keeps all that bourbon inside the barrel when they assemble it together. Now, if you were to do the same thing with red oak, no tyloses. Right, no tyloses, oh, and it would so leak out. And really, the, any other species would basically not be able to hold liquid. That's the point of the white oak. Yeah. Okay. It's, very, it's very unique in that all ability. Right. Looking at uh, hickory, we've seen it dropping in value across all the different log qualities. And looking at sugar maple, though, we have seen some strong markets for that. That's a species that uh, we have historically, or we've seen, you know, re in recent times, our pricing has been lower. And so we've seen some great growth in those uh, sugar maple markets. Red oak is a species that we do have some concern for pricing. Uh, we had a huge amount of export demand. I think 87% of the red oak lumber that we were exporting was going to China. And that market, due to full warehouses and some of that slowing economy in China, has really slowed down that demand for the export of red oak over there. Mm. And so this is one of our most common species in Kentucky, and we're seeing very limited markets for that. We have uh, a strong appetite in the flooring market for that, and if I understand correctly, that has been uh, getting filled up, and we are kind of relying on railroad tie markets uh, to 
kind of take the demand for our red oak logs. So it's important to have a good market for this red oak. So we're hoping that we see that increase um, going forward. But 2019, things are not looking optimistic with uh, some of these export talks. Um, looking at the high quality red maple logs, uh, those have held relatively firm uh, on the high end, but the medium and low quality logs, we've seen a drop of about eight to nine percent. Walnut is our most valuable species in Kentucky. Uh, we don't have huge volumes of it, but in the central and western sides of the state, there are uh, decent volumes of it. Walnut log pricing has been really mixed. Uh, high quality logs were holding really steady. The medium quality has decreased about 20%, and the low quality logs nearly doubled in their value. Now, recently we've been seeing that soften uh, due to export demand not being as strong as it was. White oak is our second most valuable species due to that bourbon demand and just how many things you can use white oak for due to its durability. Mm -hmm. It continues to remain strong and uh, we're seeing that stave demand continuing to grow. Those, uh, those high quality logs, I think we're looking at about four and a half percent growth. The medium quality logs about 7.5% growth and the low quality logs about 1.6% growth, looking statewide averages. So it looks like white oak is the only one that's had growth in all areas. I guess. <laughs> Wonder why. <Yeah. laughs> and looking at yellow poplar, a species that we have a lot of volume mm -hmm. in, um, it's been relatively flat uh, with We've had several large uh, molding and millwork facilities in the state that have really kept the value up on that here locally, um, even with some of the other markets decreasing. Uh, we've seen uh, about a 10% drop in the value of yellow poplar. Let's talk a little bit about those staves and railroad ties. You can talk a little bit about those. I noticed that the barrel staves are also in your report. Yes. So uh, explain a little bit about what you're talking so, about here. So a stave log is, is generally what they're looking for is a high quality white oak log. It's not quite a veneer log, but they'll take veneer logs. They just may not give that full value that you might get going into a veneer market. Mm -hmm. Due to the demand, they have been taking some logs that they would probably prefer not to take, uh, but they're looking for those higher quality logs. Um, and so just looking at some of the value, they're averaging about $1.30 a board foot um, statewide. And we know of prices as high as $2.40 a foot in different parts of the state. And so we're expecting this market for white oak logs to remain strong going into 2019. And as long as bourbon keeps expanding and popularity remains high, that should continue to keep growing. And explain a board foot. So a board foot is a unit of measure. And so you've got uh, 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch thick is one board foot. Okay. And so if you were looking at a, let's say a 80 year old white oak tree that was, you know, a couple logs. So logs are like 16 foot long a couple logs tall, good quality, nice and straight, you know, several logs up before you get to any limbs. That tree could have, you know, 200 something board foot in it. Uh, maybe more if it's a much larger tree. You know, the, the bigger and older they get, the more volume, the more board footage that's gonna be in those. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you do a dollar, you know, 30 a foot average and do the math, you can see where private landowners, which make up the majority of the land ownership in Kentucky, why this is a great thing for our private landowners. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, it's my understanding, Chad, that really the white oak is just so hot right now that it's really kind of driving a lot of timber harvest even, yeah, you know. There might have been areas that may have not been harvested otherwise, but yes. since they do have a component of white oak, it makes them more attractive now than maybe they would have been in the past, so, yeah. I believe so, Billy. Yeah, you know, and we got another really important thing you talk about in this report, Chad, is tie logs, yes. you know, railroad tie logs, and I guess folks may not think about them a lot, I right. mean, but they're really important, yes. and um, we supply a lot of them here out of Kentucky. Yes, we do. 
We support a huge amount of railroad ties in this state. It's one of our largest exports, as, as you know. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Um, but we've been experiencing really strong markets for those over the last year, these railroad tie logs. And uh, we're looking at about a 12% increase in the value of those from the end of 2017 until the end of 2018. We've got oak tie logs and we've got non-oak tie logs. Those non-oak tie logs, those could be maple or hickory or other species like mm -hmm. that. And those have experienced about an 11% increase. So we're looking at you know, 11 or 12% increase for these tie logs. It's a pretty large growth margin for a year. We're looking statewide for an average for those oak tie logs, uh, about $451 a thousand board foot or four, 45 cents a foot roughly. Um, and so looking at those non-oak, you know, with the maples, the hickories, they're looking at about 37 cents a board foot, roughly, at statewide averages. And so some of those prices more, mm -hmm. and that's for those delivered prices, right. I should mention. That's what yeah. the logger is getting paid, taking it to the sawmill. Right, so it does it's different it, yeah. from the stumpage So price. their logging costs are part of that Absolutely. delivered price, so they need to be accounted for. So landowners aren't going to get all of that. They'll get a portion thereof. Definitely. And, you know, and it's a nice thing about tie logs is, we, we've got so many of them. Almost every landowner probably has some tie logs on their property. Not every landowner has a stave quality white oak. Though, right. You know, so it's much, much more abundant. And I think it's because it, they can use a wider range of uh, quality, if you will. And we have that. So basically sure. what you're saying is a tie log is a lower grade of tree than a stave log would be? Yes. And yes. I think that's reflected in its price as well, you know, because it's like almost four times as much for the stave version of the same log as compared to a tie log. So it really matters. Quality matters. So you Absolutely. wouldn't have to worry about a tie log needing to replace a stave log. It, right now <laughs> it's their right. separate, separate. Well, system. you know, and I think it speaks to the value of managing our woods. Yeah. And that's one thing we try to promote. If, if landowners are interested in having productive woodlands, then managing them appropriately will help that mm -hmm. be more likely. And you can not only improve the volume out there, but you can improve the quality, which both things will end up impacting the, the price that you receive for them down the road. Mm -hmm. And how often do they replace railroad ties? So a properly treated tie should last somewhere around 30 years in oh, track. Wow. Um, there is That's like a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now there is um, an ongoing uh, court case due to a facility um, in another state that was improper, allegedly improperly treating these ties uh, instead of using creosote, which is the treatment that railroad ties receive to go in track. They were allegedly using like used motor oil and black paint just to give that appearance of treatment without the actual preservative value. And so a lot of those ties ended up rotting out within like five years. And so that is one of those market influencers that has been pushing up that demand for those railroad ties. And so we've got this extra 5 million foot of railroad ties that they're needing to purchase and get mm -hmm. treated and get out and track uh, in addition to the regular maintenance that they're putting out. So. The loggers are benefiting from having this additional demand. It's supporting, you know, the regular harvesting and landowners are benefiting from that as well and having that additional value in these railroad tie logs. So it's something that we have and the markets, you know, they come up and down mm -hmm. as far as value, but having that market there due to the sheer number, as you mentioned, that we have on our acres out there, how many yeah. railroad ties that we have in those trees. Yeah. It's a very good market for us to have. Yeah, certainly an important product for many of our woodland owners, for sure. Very much so. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. So it looks like... Um, we export a lot too. So uh, explain a little bit about where we're exporting and how much how much actually goes into exports. You know, Kentucky is so good at growing high quality stuff. We mm -hmm. really are. And our wood is no exception. 
and that is sought out around the world. It really is. And we have the, the diversity of species and we have the quality that people will seek out. And, you know, our export numbers reflect that. They're, they've been rising. This past year, we estimated $379 million in wood exports. And that's, that's up quite a bit over the last few years. And it, it appears... Well, I don't know what the tariff situation is right. going to do to it, Chad, for sure. But at least, you know, there's a lot of demand, obviously, around the world for our products, our wood products. And, you know, there's a few things that kind of lead the lead the charge, if you will, when it comes to exports. And it's maybe a no surprise to your listeners out there um, that oaks and white oaks are a big part of that export market. Absolutely. So looking at the top five Kentucky wood-related exports, uh, we've got wooden casks, you know, barrels, uh, being our largest export, those include both new and used barrels, and those are coming in at 126 million for 2018. Uh, looking at oak lumber, that's our second largest export, uh, coming in second at 87 million. Hardwood lumber that is not oak is number three with 32 million, and then those railroad ties we were just talking about coming in at number four with 24 million, and then just wood pulp is our fifth largest at 19 million and we expect that uh, one to expand we've had the uh, previously verso paper mill out in wycliffe kentucky out in ballard county has been purchased by a chinese company uh, Mm -hmm. by the name of they're calling it phoenix paper Mm -hmm. and every bit of the pulp and paper that is produced there is anticipated to be exported to china so that should be a growing export Sounds like that's a lot of dollars going there. It is, yes, it is. Okay, so could you tell us what's the flow of harvested wood in Kentucky? Actually, what is one acre? What does that end up being? You know, it all it starts with the landowner. It really does because they're the owner of those trees, Mm -hmm. and it's what they decide to do with them that really will impact the forest sector down the line. So, if you think about landowners out there, and this report, this contribution report, if your listeners can find it on the the website there, they'll see we have a nice little flow chart that kind of shows the flow of how the harvested acre here in Kentucky how it kind of moves through the supply chain and how it impacts the different forest subsectors and how it results in really a very significant contribution. Mm -hmm. So the way we came up with these estimates on how much a harvested acre contributes to Kentucky is we basically took at and looked at how much the average acre has that's harvested. It's around 3,500 board feet or so. And then we figured what the average price that people receive on that. Mm -hmm. Um, So we got a kind of a sense for that. So we we estimate the landowners are going to get over a thousand dollars on average. And those will probably honestly be a little higher quality sales than maybe average um, but about a thousand dollars to the landowner on average and if you look at the loggers they'll make about a thousand dollars on pro- harvesting that that'll be their kind of cut um, as well and then that that wood will then go from the loggers um, to the primary wood manufacturing or sawmills if you will and we estimate that that acre of wood contributes about almost um, $4,600 to that primary mill. So they're starting to add value. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see that number jump, because the more value you add um, at each step along the way, then the more kind of value is kind of received to that. Mm -hmm. And then from the second, or from the primary wood, it kind of moves on to the secondary wood products. Um, And some of that will also kind of get shot down to pulp and paper. Some will go to wood residue, but really by far our biggest one is our secondary manufacturing. And we estimate that an acre of wood, if you take that wood and see basically the product that comes out later down the road from those secondary manufacturers plus all the value added, um, nearly $9,000 is contributed to the Kentucky um, economy just because that acre of wood was harvested. One acre was Mm -hmm. harvested and all these people have touched it and added value to it along the way. So it it doesn't, we don't buy logs at at Home Depot, right? Right. We buy finished products. So Mm -hmm. to get to that finished product, there's been a lot of time and people's energy and effort and technology and transportation costs added to those all along the way. So 
So if you look at the whole big picture, uh, roughly $20,000 is what we estimate that that would contribute to um, Kentucky's economy. So it's pretty significant. Now, we don't include the paper converters in that because some of that paper actually may come from other states um, and it's, you know, may not be coming from Kentucky's forest because a large component of that is made up of softwoods. And we just don't have a lot of those here in Kentucky. So if we were to add that in, it would even be much bigger. But Mm -hmm. just to be conservative, we do estimate roughly $20,000 is that end contribution from an acre of harvested wood in Kentucky, which is really significant if you think about it. Thank you guys for coming today and presenting us with um, some great information on the economic contribution report. Um, Do you have kind of a one takeaway item for our listeners or that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I would say wood is good. (laughs) And our forests are important. They really are. Our forests contribute in so many ways. And taking care of our forests is important. Utilizing them appropriately and responsibly is critically important. And I think our forest sector does a really good job in that utilization, Chad. I really do. And just to build on what Billy said, uh, trees are a renewable resource, uh, one of our few renewable resources that we have. And in Kentucky, we're very fortunate that using good management, we don't have to go out there and plant trees. These trees grow back on their own, and using good management, we can help to make sure that we get the types of trees that we want to grow out there. And uh, mm-hmm. let's see, what else do I want to add to that? Buy wood. <laughs> Buy wood. <laughs> yeah. Buy wood products, because they really are important, and they touch our lives in so many ways. Some of the estimates are there's over 2,500 different uses of woods that we kind of use on a daily basis. Wow. Um, many of them you may not realize, you know, fingernail polish and um, um, toilet paper and, right. you know, really yeah. important things right. <laughs> <laughs> that we use, yeah. And not, not to mention the desks and the floors and the paper that we write on and all of that. I mean, mm-hmm. wood is, is so many chemicals come out of some of the wood that we process as well that are used in other industry. So wood really touches our lives in countless ways. So it's a good renewable resource worth supporting. And while the trees are growing, they help us out a lot they too. They really do. They provide a lot of other benefits uh, along the way from cleaner water, cleaner air, wildlife habitat, and just a place to recreate and kind of catch your breath a little bit. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Billy and Chad, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And if you would like more information on what you've heard on today's show, visit www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned now for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome back to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Matt Springer, Assistant Extension Wildlife Professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Before I tell you what that sound was you heard at the beginning of the show, let's play it again for you. Now that sounded like a bird. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> so that it kind of goes up and down a little bit, and that's mm-hmm. a fairly common sound throughout Kentucky, uh, and it's the eastern bluebird. Mm-hmm. So it's a one of one that you can see in a lot of places. It's not um, one that is a specialist for habitat for the most part. They like open areas around fields, but your backyard, uh, if there's food around, they'll they'll be there. Mm-hmm. So if you put out food at the feeders would they come to so them? not traditional food because okay. their diet is mostly insects okay. but if you put out so they sell those bags of mealworms mm-hmm. if you put those out they'll they'll be around um, mm-hmm. and potentially use use that as a food source um, but if you have a lot of native plants that have the food that they want which are those insects mm-hmm. they'll they'll use that area uh, quite a bit so that's, good for getting rid of them too it, That'd be they good. are a great bio control mechanism <laughs> for some of our pest species yes okay so what kind of nests do they So bluebirds, and one of the things that is very popular is to put out bluebird nest boxes. Mm. Um, And the reason why you do that is because bluebirds are what we call cavity nesters. So they like to nest in in tree cavities, so enclosed areas. Mm. Um, Traditionally, it would have been holes in trees. Mm -hmm. Um, But we can kind of simulate that by making those nest bird boxes, uh, similar to wood ducks or kestrels. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can put those out and, and uh, you'll have you know birds using those and, and 
in many ways they'll actually fight over them because they're sometimes a limiting um, resource. Oh. So Is there specific dimensions that you have to There do? are, and we actually have a publication through Cooperative Extension Service here. It's uh, FOR52 that outlines all of those things and tells you how to build how one, to build one? Oh, awesome. what sizes, where to put it when you're done, and, mm -hmm. and how to clean it. Because you do you can't just put a nest box up. You have to make sure you clean it every once in a while mm -hmm. um, to, to decrease disease and, and parasite issues. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm guessing they're blue. <laughs> they are. The males especially are blue. And that blue kind of way the sun hits them looks a little bit brighter and, and mm -hmm. not. Uh, not. Uh, and these guys are actually around the entire year. Oh. Um, but they get a lot more colorful about right now, right? Mm -hmm. So breeding time, they, right. they're a lot brighter. The The females are duller, as typical with most of but our birds. But still blue? Uh, still a light blue tinge okay. to them, yep. Yeah. I, as I was telling you earlier, they're not my favorite bluebird. The mountain right. bluebird is my favorite because like, when you think of bluebird, that's the one I think of. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we, you know, these guys aren't too shabby. Okay. And um, how many eggs do they lay? So they, they actually are um, one that will uh, lay multiple Broods a year, so upwards of three broods, and in each of those broods, they can lay anywhere between two and seven eggs. Oh, okay. um, and it takes them about, you know, a um, little over two weeks to three weeks for those eggs to hatch, mm -hmm. uh, and then about two to three weeks until those nestlings are, are out. Uh, so it takes them a little time um, to have them go from start to end. Uh, and actually, the males will gather nesting materials, but will never build the nest. They'll bring them in and throw it in there, mm -hmm. into the cavity, mm -hmm. and stand out there and sing and throw more in there to try to attract the female, um, but will never help build the nest. <laughs> Um, and That's then, interesting. yeah, and they're actually ones that uh, they'll pair up for a while, mm -hmm. um, for you know potentially multiple years. Oh. However, they doesn't mean they're the only ones they're they're visiting with. Oh, so I about see. one in four eggs will actually not be from the male. Oh, they'll be from another male. <laughs> okay. So. Um, you know, it's paired up is a loose term in nature. Right. <laughs> uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, maybe. This would be the, <laughs> yeah, you know, that would make sense. a horrible joke right? to throw out there. <laughs> it would be, yes, um, it would be. But if you do have interest in bluebirds, it's one that um, you can actually get a response from the animals. They're not a, a species of concern. They're doing actually fairly well relative to the other birds. Their population's either stable or increasing, mm -hmm. probably due to the fact we have so many bluebird nest boxes out and it's so popular. Right. So how big are they? Probably about five inches okay. in size. And, and, you know, they're about the size of a standard songbird. Is That's there a the typical bird tell. size? No. No? Okay. No. I was going to say, because um, you see all different ones. I didn't know if there was the one place. that's kind of. So our, our migrating songbirds, our neotropical migrants, tend to be a little smaller. Mm -hmm. Or at least there's a lot more of them that are smaller than are bigger. However, there's all sizes and shapes. Right. And the important thing with birds is to look at their bill shape. That tells you everything. Okay. So it tells you what they eat and, and um, it gets you down to which group of family you can figure out what bird you're looking at. Sounds like another show. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Sure. Glad to be here. Thank you for joining us today. We have a new show scheduled for summer 2019. You can listen to us live on WRFL Lexington 88.1 FM on Thursdays from 10 a.m. until noon. And at 10 a.m. we'll be playing a new episode. Then at 11 a.m. we'll play a show from our archives. So stay tuned to two shows this summer on Thursdays. If you miss our show on Thursdays, you can listen to all of our podcasts on our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.